There's no shortage of graffiti in most downtowns. From simple tags to intricate murals, it can be found in almost any alley, underpass, and subway tunnel. To most people who live and work there, it all blends into the background. But one piece of street art isn't so easy to ignore, since unlike most graffiti, this one is animated. John Freeman, an unassuming man in his mid-twenties, was out late one night in April of 2004. It was a Saturday, so he'd let loose a little more than he originally intended, and he was starting to feel the effects, so he went out back for some fresh air. This wasn't the most popular bar in the city, so when he opened up the door and stepped out, he found himself completely alone. Despite that fact, he couldn't shake the sense that he was being watched. He looked around, squinting and trying his best to focus his eyes. Just then, John thought he spotted someone behind the dumpster, so he decided to investigate. When he looked behind the dumpster, there was no one to be found. Instead, painted on the wall was a piece of street art. It was a strange piece of art too, a half-human, half-owl creature rendered in highly realistic detail. The figure was crouched over, and its eyes faced outwards. Eyes that looked far too real, like they were staring at him right out of the wall, following him as he swayed from side to side. There was something so wrong about it. Its intense gaze, its sharp beak, its grasping claws. How could anyone paint something like this? It looked like it could crawl right out of the bricks. Something about the painting made him nervous, but he couldn't look away. It was drawing him in beckoning him. There was something about it that John just couldn't resist. He stepped closer, until he was close enough to reach out and touch it. What John didn't know was that he was also close enough for it to reach out and touch him. Before he could react, he saw the painting come to life. The feathers ruffle, the hands prepare to grab, the beak opens up. For John, it was already too late. From inside the bar, the other patrons heard a loud scream from the alley. The bartender ran outside to see what was going on, but when he got there, all he found was a blood stain on the concrete. There was no sign of John Freeman, and there was no graffiti on the wall. This is just one of the dozens of recorded attacks attributed to what the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-1155 or the predatory street art. It can appear on any wall in any major metropolitan area, but it prefers ones that are out of the way and isolated, such as back alleys, lonely parking structures, subway tunnels, and underpasses. The creature depicted in the street art has the long, sinewy arms of a human, with the head and feathery body of a large owl, and though its pose changes often, it's always facing out, watching. The Foundation is no stranger to deadly works of art, such as the infamous SCP-173, the living sculpture who will snap your neck if you stop looking at it, or SCP-1074, the abstract art capable of psychologically enthralling the viewer and leading them into a state of catatonia if exposed for too long. However, what sets SCP-1155 apart from these other two is the fact that it's incredibly hard to contain and its methods are particularly violent and gruesome. But more on that later. If you spot this odd painting while you're out walking with friends, you probably wouldn't give it a second thought. But if you're alone, it's a different story. This SCP has an almost hypnotic effect when viewed by a lone person. If you spot it, you'd be overwhelmed by curiosity, and you'll feel compelled to get a closer look. You can potentially resist this hypnotic effect with some effort, especially if you're aware of its anomalous properties, meaning knowledge really is power when it comes to SCP-1155. Once you get within two meters of SCP-1155, though, the creature will jump out of the wall and strike, with attacks usually following the same pattern. First, the victim will be restrained to prevent struggle or escape. The eyes and tongue will then be removed, followed by the amputation of the hands and feet. The victim will then be disemboweled and the intestines and stomach removed, all in as little as six seconds. But not all of these attacks result in death. Some have actually managed to survive attacks by the predatory street art, with those lucky few being eligible for Class A amnestic therapy, courtesy of the Foundation. In most cases, though, there's no survivors to find and often not even a body at all. Once SCP-1155 has begun its attack, and if it remains unspotted, 
it will snatch up its prey and vanish before appearing on the wall somewhere else. The Foundation has made attempts to discover where the bodies end up by equipping D-Class test subjects with GPS trackers, but the results of these tests have been inconclusive. Recorded relocation events have covered distances as small as 15 meters or as far as 800 kilometers. But the true range of this creature's movement is unknown. If caught in the act of feeding, though, SCP-1155 will disappear, leaving its victim behind. Usually in these cases, the victim will bleed out and die, but some have survived. Two such survivors were D-Class personnel, who were used for tests to see what happened when the attacks were interrupted. Both were incoherent and badly wounded following the attacks. Their eyes were gone, and one of them also had his tongue, hands, and feet removed. Though neither could adequately communicate what had happened to them, the one who still had a tongue claimed to still be able to see, in spite of his missing eyes, and that he was still looking through his stolen eyes. He described what he could see, a kind of grisly pantry, where it appeared SCP-1155 had stashed the remains of its previous victims, perhaps to feed on later. This D-Class managed to escape from on-site quarters during an unrelated containment breach, running back to where he had been attacked by SCP-1155. He was pursued by law enforcement, who had been told by the SCP Foundation that he was an escaped mental patient suffering from serious delusions. The police chased him for several blocks before he disappeared down an alleyway. Officers at the scene reported hearing a scream, but when they got to where it came from, there was no sign of the D-Class just a dead-end alley with a blank wall. The other D-Class, the one with no tongue, was successfully relocated to an undisclosed location. While the patient was being moved, though, Foundation surveillance noted an increased level of movement from SCP-1155. The painting was appearing and disappearing, and in each relocation, its posture suggested hunting and tracking behavior, as if it was pursuing the one who got away. The places it was manifesting also became more and more public. At one point, it appeared on the side of a building right in the middle of town, though it was too high up to be reached by any of the hundreds of witnesses. While all of this was happening, the D-Class being held for medical treatment was becoming increasingly distressed. The Foundation theorized that the entity may have been frustrated at losing its prey, and that it would likely continue to relocate in and out of highly visible areas until the D-Class was returned to it. Because of this, the executive decision was made to take the D-Class to the outskirts of the city. SCP-1155 manifested in the area, and the team left both it and the D-Class unobserved. Both the creature and the D-Class soon disappeared, and SCP-1155 resumed its more manageable hunting behavior. Due to this SCP's ability to jump from place to place, it has proven difficult, if not impossible, to contain, and as a well-earned Keter-Class designation as a result. At first, the Foundation tried physically removing the wall on which the SCP had manifested, but this only caused it to relocate. A similar result happened following attempts to paint over or damage the painting. Current containment procedures involve closely monitoring the disused shopping mall lot where SCP-1155 currently seems to live, for lack of a better term. The mall has been marked as condemned, and Foundation agents continually monitor the area, posing as security guards to dissuade any civilian traffic from entering the danger zone. Mobile Task Force Pi-1, nicknamed the City Slickers, tried to obscure any surface on which the creature appeared, but this didn't end well. First, the team leader ordered that a vending machine be placed in front of the graffiti while it was located in an alley that transients were known to frequent. This was supposed to be only a temporary stopgap, intended to stop any unsuspecting person from falling under SCP-1155's hypnotic spell. In time, a proper containment zone would be established, with more agents forming a security perimeter around the area. But by the time the extra resources arrived and the vending machine was moved, the painting had disappeared. It had responded to the obstruction by relocating and reappearing on a wall at a nearby children's playground. The Foundation quickly mobilized, interrupting SCP-1155 in the middle of an attack in order to trigger another relocation. But sadly, several lives were already lost by the time they arrived. The entire ordeal was a tragic and costly mistake on the Foundation's part. It seems that when SCP-1155 is obstructed, it gets angry 
Instances where it relocated after being obstructed more often than not resulted in it moving to a much more public place that would be harder to contain for the foundation. While it previously appeared in low traffic areas, it now seemed emboldened following containment attempts and was readily appearing in public spaces. It was argued that all of humanity would be better off allowing a few people to be taken by SCP-1155 every couple of years than risk it ending up in a heavily populated area where it could endanger who knows how many people before it was noticed. The Foundation continued to research possible containment procedures, though, and eventually figured out the perfect minimum distance at which they could create a barrier so that it wouldn't be noticed by the SCP itself. This was one of their more expensive containment protocols, as it required purchasing an entire mall, only to shut it down and condemn it under the pretense of there being a dangerous sinkhole underneath it. The expense seems to have been worth it, though, as SCP-1155 is currently still inside the parking structure connected to the mall. The mall and the parking structure are under round-the-clock surveillance via motion capture security cameras, and while there have been no other relocations, there's no telling what might trigger one again. So if you live in a big city, and you find yourself walking alone at night, Keep an eye on the street art. If you spot a painting of half-human, half-owl that you could swear wasn't there before, resist the urge to check it out, and just cross the street instead. Now go check out another tale of a man-eating monster, SCP-082 Fernand the Cannibal, or SCP-3001 Red Reality, for one of the scariest anomalous locations known to man.